This is Going Back, Remembering UGA. Today is January the 8th, 2009, and I'm Claude McBride. We're pleased to welcome former Vice President Dr. S. Eugene Yance, who retired in January of 2000. Welcome, Gene, and thank you for agreeing to this interview. It's my pleasure to be here. Good. What was your official title at the time of your retirement? The official title was Vice President for Public Service and Outreach. It was formerly Vice President for Services, and we tried to get modern and yeah. <laughs> expanded the title. <laughs> well, what areas of responsibility did this entail? Well, the university, being a land-grant institution, has three missions, teaching, research, and public service. And I had the public service responsibilities. And what was these some areas in okay. public service? The areas in public service were ones that, of course, were dealing with the sponsoring society out across the state, some on the campus. The Cooperative Extension Service, which came through the College of Agriculture, the Georgia Center for Continuing Education, the Institute of Community and Area Development, uh, the Institute of Government, uh, Marine Extension Service, and on and on. Uh, botanical Garden? Botanical Garden, yes. And the Experiment Station? No, not the Experiment Stations. Okay. Although I did visit the Experiment Stations quite uh -huh. frequently. Well, you were in touch with a lot of people all over our well, state. Well, that's right. That time. I actually was in every county in the state of Georgia. Hmm. Do you have any idea how many persons were employed under your supervision? Well, well not directly, but they were, of course, did this kind of work. It's around 2,200. And do you have any idea? Uh, the number of people with whom they dealt? Well, we used to say that we made contacts with about a million people a year. Mm. So when you think about extension service and all of that. Mm -hmm. Now you work with four different administrations, uh, Davidson, Stanford, Knapp, and Adams. Uh, tell us something about uh, Fred Davidson and well, his administration. Fred Davidson is the person, of course, that appointed me to that position. And Fred Davison, uh, of course, a native Georgian, he loved the University of Georgia more than anything. I'm sure that was the case. And he had a burning desire to see that it improved and moved along. He spoke in terms of becoming a world-class university. He wanted to be a land-grant, sea-grant university like those very successful ones in the Midwest, in California and in Cornell. So his goal was to, was to be like that. Uh, Working with him was quite easy. He uh, was not demanding, but he kept tabs on what you were doing all the time. And he loved to get out of the state himself. And he, he understood public service and outreach, which was very good, because unless your boss understands it or something, it's, it's not, not quite as easy. And he was supportive of public service and outreach, uh, both in terms of funding and in terms of uh, supportive in terms of making sure that uh, our programs were doing what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Now you were here um, with Davidson during the Jan Kemp uh, trials and everything. Were you involved in that? Yes, I actually had to get on the witness stand in Atlanta. <laughs> I had chaired the committee on campus that uh, reviewed uh, uh, her situation and uh, we of course we upheld what the administration had done and so therefore I became a target. Uh, on, in, in the you won't trial. forget that. Never will I forget that. Never will I forget. What do you think has been the outcome of that? Of the Jan Kemp mm -hmm. thing? Well, I think it's made people, uh, at least the universities that have a large, a, large uh, athletic programs, more sensitive to making sure that they, are, you know, are doing their doing their job. Not that we were or were not. I don't know, don't want to get into that. But uh, this was the outcome of it. Mm -hmm. After. Um, Dr. Davidson left. We had um, Henry King Stanford, who only served for one year. Um, by the way, we just lost him. The yes, last that's right. Couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And um, but he made quite an impact during that one year. How was it working for him? It was fun working for Dr. Stanford. He came here. He had never been on a land grant campus. He had no idea about the broad public service uh, mission, what we were doing at the, here, but he loved it. 
He loved it. He, uh, he loved the slogan that we had, the state is our campus. And he would go across the state saying that. One time I was in the audience over at Georgia State University when he got up and he said, welcome to the University of Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> he said, the state is our campus. So uh -huh. you people are on our campus, things like that. Uh, but he was it, was, it was fun. He used to call himself an evangelist. Now he was definitely an evangelist and he, from Tybee Light <laughs> to rising fawn in the mountains and this, uh -huh. yeah, he, he, he loved that. And we went, I remember going to the Sun Belt Expo back when the University of Georgia was managing it and he says, what a, what a classroom. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. How about uh, Dr. Knapp? You well, Dr. Knapp uh, was, uh, he was a, really had a legacy in, in outreach. His great, great, great grandfather started the Agricultural Extension Service, but he had never been at a university other than as a student at Iowa State and I guess University of Wisconsin, involved deeply in the service program. And he was very much interested in it. And we traveled all over the state. We traveled in foreign countries. We had programs then in about, um, I guess, 11 foreign countries then under the Office of International Development. And I remember very well the one we took to Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, it, <laughs> It was, we had, it was in Burkina Faso, and people never even knew, heard of Burkina Faso, but you had to go through Paris to get there, and that was really a disappointment, having to go through Paris. We, in fact, we were so disappointed, we spent two days there. <laughs> and so, and we had two evenings, of course, going out to eat. And Nick Edis, had, the uh, Vice President for Development, had spent a lot of time in Paris. So he recommended restaurants to us, and I said, well, Chuck, I'll pay for the first night, and you pay for the second. Well. We went to this restaurant and we got the bill and it was something like $280. The next night, Dr. Knapp's bill was about $100. And I think that was on purpose, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I got back and I asked Roger Comley, who was working at the Georgia Center then, about Paris. He had gone to Paris, he was a, he was a connoisseur of Paris food. I told him where we'd eaten. He said, well, no wonder your bill was that expensive. That was the most expensive restaurant in Paris. So I, I may have been set up, I'm not sure. <laughs> but that was a delightful trip. We went on down to Africa and that was very, very interesting. Okay. A lot of exciting things happened um, during the years that you were Vice President for Outreach and Public Service. Um, you oversaw, for instance, the Botanical Gardens. That's right. Had, what are some things that happened there? Well, the Botanical Garden was built solely with private money. And uh, we formed what we call an advisory council. And it just bloomed, it blossomed. It was made up of some of the wealthiest people in the state. Many of them had never even gone to the University of Georgia, but they liked to work together. And so because of their associations and because of some good uh, people that uh, were giving us money, it grew, it grew rapidly. Uh, the uh, Dean Day, the, Dean, uh, the, Smith, uh, see, the Cecil B. Day Foundation became a big benefactor. And, and of course, the Callaway Foundation was a benefactor. They built the, uh, they built the conservatory there. So all the buildings in there and everything that's been added has been with private money. And I guess now there must be, uh, you know, 200,000 people a year come there. Mm -hmm. It was sort of a hobby, uh -huh. very exciting hobby. But you added the conservatory and then the chapel? The chapel was added. That's the, the, that was a Dean, Dean Day Smith gift. And mm -hmm. then we added uh, the headquarters for the state garden clubs. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then what, I don't know, we added several things. And then you got it uh, designated the officials. Yeah, the, the official uh, botanical Garden for the state of Georgia. So it's known as the State Botanical Garden of Georgia, which is slightly redundant, but that's mm -hmm. its title. And you expanded the programs in the uh, Georgia Center for Continuing Education. That's you right. got a surprise in there along the way. You were good at fundraising and everything, but you were competing with Michigan. That's you, right, Michigan that's right. Michigan State. Right? Michigan State is where the first Kellogg Center was built. The Georgia Center, of course, that was funded largely by the, in terms of building its physical plant by the Kellogg Foundation, opened in 1957. Well, it quickly overgrew its space, and we wondered how we were ever going to get any more funding. Uh, we first were talking about a million dollars from the state, 
1984, we had convinced the Kellogg Foundation to help us with some expansion in the building, but largely in the terms of expansion of programming. And we received $8.4 million from the Kellogg Foundation. At that particular time, it was the largest grant it had ever received outside the state of Michigan. And when they made the grant, the Kellogg officer that came down and said, well, it was supposed to be Michigan State, but you people were ready and they weren't. And that allowed us to couple with state money, which the state added $5.4 million to it. We expanded the Georgia Center considerably, and we added uh, a lot of extra programs. Mm -hmm. Now, you were not, um, let's see, you were with Dr. Adams for? Well, he, I, he came when he comes, 97? Okay, well, I retired, you see, in 2000, so I was with him three years. And when he came, he studied the administrative structure at the top of the university, and he added a provost. So I didn't report directly to him, although I worked with him some. And he had had no experience in a land-grant institution when he came, so there was a, a, long, a, long, a learning curve there and becoming acquainted curve on his, on his part. But he, you know, he was, he, was, he, he was a good person. He was supportive of public service. I always admired his speaking ability. And, uh, and that was, you know, that was something. He, he, whenever he spoke about public service, he spoke about it uh, with passion. Mm -hmm. Now, what really he's done, in, in my opinion, as he's expanded the physical facilities of the campus. And that, will may, that may be one of his large legacies in mm -hmm. addition to adding other colleges and schools. Okay. You um, worked, did you follow Dr. J.W. Fanning? Yes, I followed Dr. J.W. Fanning. He was the first vice president for services, and he was in that position about six years. And I was down at Tifton as director of the Rural Development Center, and when they got to looking for a successor, somehow or another, they pointed at me. And so I followed him, and I came here in January 1, uh, 1972. And he'd had a six-year stint. When I was through, I had a 29-year stint. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, um, he was well-respected um, throughout the, the country and the state. In fact, right. um, you admired him greatly. You even wrote um, his biography. That's right. That's right. When he died, uh, his two children, uh, gave me permission to, along with the assistance of Dick, Nees, of Dick Neesmith, to, to write his biography. So I had written about whatever, Dick Neesmith contributed one chapter, which is a very important chapter, so I wrote it. And he was well liked. And so here I am, traveling in the state, not following in his footsteps, you don't get in his shoes, a man like J.W. Fanning. But I say that he was probably the most widely known and widely uh, most, uh, most, let me say, it, most heavily admired person in the state of Georgia of the 20th century. I'd have never heard him, never heard anybody say a bad word about that mm -hmm. man, and that's unusual in the academic circles. <laughs> um, but that's not the only book you've authored. Yeah, yeah, I've authored three. I brought copies of them here this morning. I just, you know, I'm not going to read them to you, but this is the Fanning <laughs> okay. book, and Alive as Long as He Lived. And the reason that particular title was selected was that when he was addressing a group of people, he'd end up by saying, may you be alive as long as you live. And he definitely was. A, a second book that I wrote was about Cuba. And this is a copy of it called Hola Cuba, which means, of course, hello Cuba. Just about the time I retired here at the university, a man wrote a letter here and said, I want somebody to go with me to Cuba that speaks Spanish and or at least can communicate in it. And knows Latin American agriculture. Well, I had been all over Latin America with the American Potash Institute for about six years. So I sort of met his qualifications, and in early 2000, we were, went to Cuba. What a trip that was. And I'd come back and tell people about Cuba, and I actually went three more trips with him, and you couldn't explain Cuba. You just can't. So I decided I'd write a book, and, which I did, and, and with color pictures, this is what's in the book. It's, I would say it's uh, an expression of the life and conditions in Cuba in the earliest part of the 21st century. Uh, you also led or uh, helped to set up an alumni trip uh, to Cuba when no one else could go. That's right. Uh, what was 
that? You had to have special state. Well, Department. you see, we don't have diplomatic relations with Cuba, and I, and it should be we should have, I think. Well, alumni people wanted to go down, and that that particular time, groups could go. The Treasury Department is where you get permission to go. Oddly enough, you could go as a group as long as it was an educational or uh, a cultural trip. So I went down with them. That was. Uh, one of the trips I made to Cuba, the fourth one that I made. So we, this was an eyeful because it's such a surprise when you land in Cuba. There you go back to the 1950s, old cars everywhere. And uh, it's, just, it's just so different. Mm -hmm. And the first thing they want to do, of course, is to clean up the place and buy some land and go down there and build. Well, that's not possible. Yeah, we were the um, envy of other institutions and their alumni travel programs and I was getting all kind of calls about how we were able to do this you know? right. and uh, you were well traveled in um, all over South America mm -hmm. you That's led right. a group to Argentina right for us was that um, your background there from your days at the Potash Institute? Yes with, and of course with the University because Office of International Development was one that I started uh, in, in, in my area because outreach means, you know, get off the campus. And uh, so it was technical assistance, educational program, and Dr. Dahl Schneider was head of that. And I had developed some relationships with Argentina, with Salvador University. In fact, I was surprised that one, one of my trips down there, they made me a knight of Argentina. <laughs> And so, but anyway, that, that tour was, uh, we started out in Argentina and then we wind up going around Cape Horn and leaving, coming back from, uh, from Chile. Mm -hmm. Now, um, one of the things that you instigated, I guess, was your idea and have done that is, um, received such favorable comment um, in approval is the new faculty tour. Mm -hmm. How yeah. did that come about and well, what did it entail? New faculty tour, I was on a, a committee for the State Department, of, well, State Commerce Department, Commerce, uh, Depart I'll get it right in a minute, but anyway, I was on one of their, one of their committees. And this committee had been working, uh, trying to bridge what they call the gap between academe and the business world. And they had had one program. They had a faculty member from Georgia Southern who had gone to work for a summer for Piggly Wiggly. And Piggly Wiggly sent one of their vice presidents to work for Georgia Southern. Once, and they were just, 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 just enamored by the results of that. And so I'm sitting in this meeting and I said, well, we have about 2,000 faculty members at the University of Georgia. And if we do one a year, that'll take 2,000 years to get it done. <laughs> and I said to myself, you know, the thing to do is to take these new faculty and put them on a bus and go around the state for about a week, let them see the state, learn about its geography, meet the people, let the people meet them. And this would be a lot more beneficial. So in 1977, after going through a lot of machinations and getting some help from Georgia Power Company and other places, we launched the first new faculty tour. And it was successful way beyond my expectations. Now, this was the first time this had been done by anybody in the country. And so later it was emulated by Madison mm -hmm. University, first Madison, and then, of course, Michigan State University. It wound up about 20 other universities in the country doing it. So I, I led that tour for 23 years. What did it entail? What did you do? Well, we, start, <laughs> we started out here, went out to the Botanical Garden, and a little orientation talk there and got everybody on the bus and from here we started up north and we stopped at the poultry industry uh, and uh, in Gainesville and we visited uh, various parts of it. We actually the first two, two years we stopped at a processing plant on the way to Gainesville and that was an eye-opener because I didn't realize people had never seen a chicken kill couldn't stand it. <laughs> So after two years, we cut that out. The reason I noticed they were having trouble, we had chicken that day for lunch up at uh, Berry College, and they weren't eating it. <laughs> and I said, don't you people like <laughs> fried chicken? And they said, Dr. Yance, don't you remember we were just in a poultry processing plant? <laughs> when I grew up on a farm, we cut the head off the chicken, and we didn't, you know, you, you had a different experience. So we did that for 23 years, and 
those people, are, I see them now if I get on campus, and I'm writing a book about that. Just about finished. The title of that will be Back on the Bus. Mm -hmm. And the reason that title came about was every time we finished stop, I'd say, okay, back on the bus, because we wanted to keep our schedule. And it was a busy schedule. It was sort of like being in boot camp. Mm -hmm. But they, uh, they really delighted. And I, the book is, I hope to get it done. It's going to have okay. colored pictures. I will get it done. It'll be in print by the middle of the year, I think. So. But then you left Berry College after Gainesville. Well, we went to Gainesville College, and then we went up to Berry. Sometimes we went to Dahlonega the second year, about the third year, and we didn't go back up to But we went to Carpet Mill at Dalton, and then Cartersville, we either won there, and then from Cartersville, we would come to Atlanta. And we would go uh, over by the governor's mansion, and. We would uh, visit other places there. I can't think of the name of that place over there near the governor's mansion. But anyway, uh, I, I don't know. Anyway, we'd visit there, and then we would visit Georgia State, probably for lunch, and then the, the state capitol. And we'd go there, and then in the evening, we'd have a reception at one of the consul general's homes. You know, they have about uh, 20 of those in the city of Atlanta. And I thought it would be nice for them to learn that part of Georgia, the international part of Georgia. Now, the, the consul generals loved working with universities. And when we'd go into one of their homes, we'd move from one, every year we'd change about, they would get the consul corps, the whole consul corps there. It would be a, quite a thing. And then after that, we'd go to dinner probably at the Nico Hotel or later at the alumni office over there, at the restaurant that's there. And, uh, it was just, it was just that. That was a, that was a class evening. And then after there, we'd leave and go through Macon or maybe Callaway Gardens and stop at a farm or two and Fort Valley State College, and then we'd go to Tifton at the big experiment station there, and uh, then we'd have a reception with the people of Tifton that night. And the next day, we'd go across South Georgia, stopping in Osceola. Why Osceola? Well, Charles Harris lived there, and he was a member of the Board of Regents, mm -hmm. and that was one of the best stops that we had. The whole community showed up. The whole community showed up. The, and the county agent would always introduce every one of these people and tell what they did and the faculty members couldn't believe it. And the county agents played a very important role in this tour because they always helped arrange things at the local level. From there, we went to Piggly Wiggly at, and because they were one of the sponsors and, uh, at Vidalia. And we'd stop at a Vidalia Onion place, maybe. Then we went to the state prison at Reedsville two years. We didn't do that but twice. That got kind of hairy. <laughs> <laughs> and then from there, we went to Savannah. Now all this, going from Tifton all through that to Savannah was one day now. And uh, we'd get to Savannah, we'd do the waterfront, and then we'd go out to the Marine Extension Service office on Skidaway Island and go for a boat ride in the, in the Georgia Bulldog. And then we would come back and have an enormous seafood dinner and then one of the highlights of the week was that the faculty would put on a little play after that was over. They had, we had appointed a committee on Monday. Now you've got to entertain us on Thursday night <laughs> down, at, down at Skidaway. And those were, those were really something. They told us a lot about what, what, was go, what they'd learned on the tour. Mm -hmm. Then after we had spent the night in Savannah, we made it back to Athens the next day, not without stopping at the, at the uh, nuclear, nuclear power plant. Uh, there in uh, near Wayne's, uh, anyway, I can't even think of the nuclear power plant at the name at the moment. That's going to disappoint George Power, <laughs> but Vogel, Plant Vogel. And we'd, 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 we'd visit that, and then after we left there, we'd uh, come across the state and, st uh, you know, and talk about it. Every time we went through a county, all the data were given about the county and, you know, and all when it was founded. And it was a, it was a, it was a trip in geography and history, too. We would stop at one of the parks there, and just to R and R, I guess, in the afternoon. And from there, we went uh, to Rock Eagle. We had visited every county. We talked about the extension service, and we had a little reception at Rock Eagle. That was our final stop. And I'd like to tell you a little story about there. Uh, okay. The purpose of this tour, of course, was to acquaint new faculty members with Georgia. And so we got there on Friday evening, and I, I would say now, we've been on this for a week. Is there anything any of you'd like to say? Well, there was a new faculty member from Washington, and Washington, D.C., and she said, I'd like to speak. She said, 
I didn't really want to come to Georgia, but you people recruited me, and I came and said, if I for sure didn't want to go on this trip. And she said, but after I've been out in the state of Georgia, and I have met all these fine people and seen these county agents and what have you, I'm exactly where I ought to be. She's still here today. And I thought that was That's remarkable. Great. When I saw her at the Botanical Garden that morning, waiting to get on the bus, I said, uh-uh, she's not gonna like this. <laughs> <laughs> and she didn't for a while, but that's uh -huh. how, that's what the trip did to people. Uh -huh. The uh, head of the Germanic and Slavic language department, who from Germany himself, just got tears in his eyes down at, down at Osula when Charles Harris, Charles Harris would say, we send you our most precious possessions and we expect you to educate them. Now we know we aren't trained as well here, so give them a chance. And he'd say, look around this room, said these people pay your salaries and don't you ever forget it. <laughs> That's so it was that the sort of thing that we did. Yeah, that was a um, grand thing that you came up with. Um, now, you're a native of North Carolina. That's right, native of North Carolina. You've got to be from somewhere, Claude. <laughs> well, comment on that. Growing up in the Depression years, you were Yeah, born I was born in 1930. 30? 1930. I may have caused the Depression. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, I had... Worked on this, I mean, grew up on a farm, family of seven children. I had 67 first cousins, and none of them lived more than, well, maybe five miles from home. There was one family that roved around a little bit, but they were, it was pretty much, it's rather interesting that there were 34 of those on my father's side of the family and 33 on my mother's side, mm -hmm. so equally divided. Her name was Lore and mine was Jantz. And this was a big German settlement. It was, uh, had come, they had come out of Pennsylvania down here. So we were small farmers. And we, I think we sort of raised each other. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way it was in, in that area. So I grew up on this farm. And so I went off to North Carolina State when I was 18 years old and really didn't come back home except for the summertime. So I left home about that time. Now those formative years were, were something you started out in the 30s, you went through the, I remember since about 35, 36. You remember the Depression and you remembered World War II, of course, which was such a time. 130 million people in the country then and eight, 16 million in the armed services. Everybody was involved in the war effort. So that was such a, such a upbringing. That, so I wrote about it, I wrote a book about it. And, what did uh, you call it? I called it, We Are What We Were. We are because of what we were, because of our heritage. And here was the German heritage and all that. And then every, piece, every person we've ever met has impacted you and everything you've ever done has made you what you are today. Mm -hmm. And that's been a very popular book mm -hmm. in North Carolina and everywhere else too, as far as there. It's been, had three printings. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I'm through with that. And then the next one will come, will be the back on the bus book. Okay. Take us through your um, education and professional life early okay. thing. You went to North Carolina State. I went State. to North Carolina State and uh, majored in agriculture and got a master's degree in soil science and agronomy. And I went on up to Cornell, decided I'd get it all done without interrupting either one of the degrees. So I went to Cornell then in agronomy and uh, got my PhD from there. Mm -hmm. Fantastic experience at Cornell. That was not the first time I'd been out of the South, but it was the first time for any long period of time. Thing, a lot of things impressed me there was their relaxed, relaxed atmosphere, which I was surprised about. And then, of course, all the snow in the wintertime. <laughs> one, one went away at 143 inches. Oof. So I, that, I remember those days, and I've been back up there a couple of times uh, since that time. And then you went to work. Then I went to work. The first job I had was the University of Maryland in their agronomy department. And I taught introductory soil science and did some research with, in forages, fertilizing alfalfa with potassium. And so uh, I didn't stay there very long, three years. And then the Potash Institute downtown Washington, I knew a couple of people there and they came to me and took me away from probably the best thing I ever loved was teaching. and. Uh, so I went downtown to work in Washington with Potash Institute, and I had the 13 northeastern states as my region. So I visited the land-grant schools there for, for a while. And then uh, North Carolina State was calling, 
and I went back there. I uh, went to North Carolina State uh, to teach soils in the soils department. So I taught introductory soils there for four years, taught soil fertility and fertilizers along with that, and, and uh, advised a number of graduate students, and did some research out in the field. So then the Potash Institute called again <laughs> from Atlanta, and that's how I got to Georgia. And they had the job there as vice president for their southern region. And included in that southern region was all of Latin America. So I decided, you know, the chance to have this international experience, I can't turn down. And the chance to learn the rest of the South, I couldn't turn down. I was stationed in Atlanta, but I had 13 southern states again. I mean, in the region, 13 states, and then all of Latin America. So I was at Latin America and back and forth and traveling all over the place. And then there was a place called the University of Georgia called me. Uh, and I went to, to, down to Tifton. I was asso associate dean of the College of Agriculture and director of the Rural Development Center. And it was set up to have a program that would improve the quality of life in the rural areas. So many people were leaving the rural areas in Georgia to going to Atlanta and going to other places. And when I took that job in 1980, uh, no, 1968, um, over half the counties in the state were losing people. That hadn't been that long ago. Mm -hmm. So we were trying to reverse that. We thought, well, Atlanta's growing too fast. Everybody's going there causing problems in Atlanta. If we can make them more useful where they are, then that's what it was all about. And then two and a half years later, uh, Mr. J.W. Fanning was retiring, and first thing you know, I was called up here to a football game and sitting up in the president's box, and I wondered what in the world is going on. I thought maybe they just wanted to learn, since I was director of the rural elements, and I sat beside of Lamar Dodd. First time I'd ever met him personally, that was an experience. And with about, uh, I'd say about three or four weeks after that, Dr. Davidson came down to Tifton and says, we want you to come up and succeed Mr. Fanny. And uh, that's what happened. So I came here in January 1972. Yeah. And so you were with the university, you retired with how many years? Well, you could buy time, well, with the university itself, I retired with a retirement program of 39.8 years because you could move time from North Carolina State and, Corn and, and Maryland. And then the Louise McBee helped us with the retirement by all our sick mm -hmm. leave counting <laughs> that, we, and it, that we hadn't used. So I had 39.8 years. Mm -hmm. With your retirement, but actually you were at the university or with the university? Well, I was with the university 29 years uh, plus three, uh, actually 32 years. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned Lamar Dodd. Who are some other characters <laughs> or real personalities? Personalities? You remember? Well, um, Hubert Owens, I remember him. Mm -hmm. He was, at that particular time, he was uh, retired as, he was the dean of the School of, en uh, School of Environmental Design, I guess it was called. And, of course, Lamar was a retired uh, professor of art and former head of the art department. So I remember him, and I remember uh, oh, just a number of people I can't rule off the Did tip. Did you have an old Dean Tate? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> he was around, and we used to, uh, we, he, I used to go out and speak at the alumni clubs with, yeah. uh, with uh, Dave Mui. And Dean Tate would go with us. I think he was making sure that we said the right things. <laughs> and we would, it was, it was always a trip with him. He would get in the car and he would talk profusely until we got to the place we were going to meet. And I remember one time when I was speaking up at uh, one of the places, I can't remember the town, but we had gone through Tate up there. And so I'm speaking and just right in the middle of my speech, he stood up and said, I'd like to add something to that. <laughs> so it was that sort of thing he'd do. And on the way home, he'd crawl in the back of the car and Dave would drive and he'd go to sleep. And I met, I mean, we, we got to know each other on campus here too. Uh, one of the great people the state ever produced. Uh, who um, among the administrators do you remember particularly who made great input in the university? Well, um, Fred Davidson did. Mm -hmm. Because when he went in as president, he said, we're going to raise the image of this institution. And he said, we're going to make we're just going to strive to be a world-class research university. 
And they started under his beginning there. They created a whole new scheme for getting promoted that really caused, he called the faculty to, you know, to task on whether they're doing their jobs or not. He started bringing in talent from outside of the state and uh, his the expectation of faculty really arose under his under his leadership. He had such a burning desire to make this institution, uh, you know, climb in the ladder, and he had a tremendous impact on them. And Dr. Knapp had his impact, and Dr. Stanford has it his impact, and uh, and of course Dr. Adams is making an impact as well. Mm -hmm. There were others, you know, Gene Odom, of course, a leader in ecology. Uh, was, he was an outstanding person. We had people in the chemistry department. Lars Youngdahl, was, he, I always admired him for what he did. Uh, so uh, these people that, and uh, uh, Giles uh, in the uh, genetics department, Norman Giles, and these were, these were people that were benchmark people for this university. Mm -hmm. Somewhere along the way you met a girl named Ruth. Yeah, Ruth. Uh, it wasn't in the Bible, but it is a biblical name. But when I was at North Carolina State, I met her. And we have been married now over 54 years. That's great. So and you have a son and daughter. I have a son and a daughter. They both live in Atlanta. That's good. Now, um, you're um, involved in a lot of community and civic mm -hmm. activities and have been in that. That's right. I've always tried to do my bit, but, uh, you know, I've been a member of the Kiwanis Club since I moved to Athens. So how did I get in the Kiwanis Club? Well, Dr. F Mr. Fanning had been a member of the club, and it was sort of ordained that I become a Kiwanian. <laughs> that's, right. a, that's a great group of people. I've enjoyed that relationship, and I've had a relationship, of course, with the Rotary Club, uh -huh. and, which is an entirely not different, but uh, uh -huh. a little, little different mission. Good. And I was on Downtown Development Authority for a while, and. Uh, I was on the, com uh, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, Athens Commerce, uh, the, uh, Commerce Board and that sort of thing. And I, so I've been involved in a lot of these, a lot of the things. And the Red Cross now. Yeah, the Red Cross too. That's right. Uh -huh. I'm still on, I'm on the Red Cross Board now. You, um, what are some of the accomplishments of which you're most proud, Gene? Well. I'm going to give you one you're probably going to be surprised. That was getting the county agents faculty rank. Mm -hmm. Here they were out in the state working for the university. Sometimes they felt very distant from the university. And they didn't have a scheme that, I mean, a, a, a career ladder that would allow them to move up and be rewarded for their work. So Dr. Knapp, I proposed it to him, and he said, that sounds like a good idea. So giving them, establishing faculty rank for them was one of them. Now, I think the buildings and the outside money that my office was able to get, I'd have to mark that because yeah. that's tangible evidence, you know. Mm -hmm. The botanical garden you mentioned, the addition to the Georgia Center, selling that to the Kellogg Foundation, the J.W. Fanning building that sits on Lumpkin Street, uh, got that from the legislature. and. Uh, those were the main three. Oh no, the, uh, the, I forgot about Lucy Cobb. We got money there to re renovate it. That's where the Institute of Government's located. Mm -hmm. So those physical facilities are there as a result of work out of my office. And uh, I guess, you know, just uh, oh, we created new service programs to leadership and things like that. You have, um, you're from North Carolina. You've lived in the Northeast and traveled all over the world, and um, particularly in South America, Latin America. Well, I've all. been in 80 countries. I went around the world one time yeah. on a trip. <laughs> and um, all over Georgia and everything, being from North Carolina. Yet, when you retired, you and Ruth, you stayed in Athens. Well, we stayed in Why? Athens. Well, we stayed in <laughs> Athens because we love it here. And of course, we love our roots too, as well and our children in Atlanta. And Ruth has a great circle of friends here. And we, somebody said, well, why didn't you go back to Raleigh? And I said, well, you know, this is, these are our friends here. This is, where, this is what we know. Somebody asked me one time, said, how long are you going to stay in Athens? I said, well, we have our funeral plots. <laughs>
barbecue at the same yeah. tomorrow. Yeah, I forgot about it. Why, why did you do that, and why was that important? Well, it's important for people to get together and relax. And Well, Sam Mitchell has a farm out here in Oconee County, and we were talking about, somehow or another, we were talking about barbecue. And I said, well, you know, I grew up in North Carolina, and they are famous for barbecue in the town where I'm from, Lexington, North Carolina, is known. They call themselves the barbecue capital of the world. They only have about 50 restaurants there. So uh, Sam said, well, why don't we have a barbecue out at my farm? And I said, well, if you do, I'll make North Carolina barbecue. My wife makes, she can make the slaw. as slaw is different than you have down in Georgia, and, do, and the sauce. And I said, I can get the, you know, the salt. My, my nephew is in the business. He's, he's not going to give me the formula for making the sauce. That's like the Coca-Cola formula. So anyway, so uh, I thought it was important to, uh, this would be a good outing for the, all the directors and public service and outreach and some other few people. And so it was about 200 people out there. And we did that for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just absolutely great. Uh, a great, uh, a great thing to have camaraderie you build and things like that. But not only the children came and wives came and everybody. It was quite a crowd. I invited the consular corps one time and only two of them found it <laughs> <laughs> that year. <laughs> and Bill and his wife came out and uh, filmed it. And they, we have a little uh, eight-minute or to a fifteen-minute film about the barbecue. Well, I never knew about that, so I couldn't ask you about it. That's great. <laughs> well, they liked the barbecue, didn't they, Bill? Great. Yeah, it's, and, I st and I go to North, North Carolina now, there's still some of them said, could you bring me some back? <laughs> right. And so I bring it back to them. Uh, <laughs> great. I just wanted something else to do, I guess, Bill. <laughs> yeah, and you're quite a gardener. Yeah, and I also, I make golf clubs. You know, make golf clubs? I don't now I much because uh, now the, well, it may have since we were in recession again. <laughs> 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 These younger generation, they're going to buy golf clubs. They're going to get ones that got to factory made and everything, you know, Big Bertha and all of that. So uh -huh. uh, I even, had a, I even have a, had a golf club of my own, I called Amin Irene. <laughs> Designed it and had it made in China. And uh, sold 50 of them, I guess, to people. It was like the Big Bertha. I remember seeing the one you made. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to tell you my best story about... Except for Wren's. Uh, well, no, deer too. Indeed. Deer coming in, and I decided I'd get me a BB gun, one that had a little power to it, and I'd sting them. But I found out you can't teach a deer anything. Now, one day I went out, got out of my house, and two of them were out there standing about 60 feet away. And I get this BB gun, and I shoot, and I kill one of them. <laughs> With a BB gun. And I should, I, where I had hit that deer, I do not know. It made a big leap, and down it went. I hated it. I said, what am I going to do with this animal now? <laughs> but I never did find out where the shot went in, but I made a mistake in disposing of him. I buried him. I should have tied him up in the tree and, and got Ruth to come out and take a picture of me with my BB gun and write a story for Field and Stream, how to bag your deer with a BB gun. Yeah. <laughs> but he killed him. I tell this, you killed him with a BB gun? Yeah, I did. They never, people won't believe it. You were going to sting him. I was just going to sting him. I have a feeling he had a heart attack. Yeah, maybe that was. <laughs> got he was going to die after he saw you walk out with a BB gun. <laughs> yeah, he thought, well, this thing won't do anything. Hey, well, I've had, he the lay there. The terminal heart, H-A-R-T, <laughs> attack. Yeah, he, 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 I lead him, left him there overnight, and I dragged him back. It, was, it had rained a lot, about like it had now. I dragged him up the back a lot, and I dug a grave and buried him there. That now, years nice. from now, when they're building a house back there and those bones come up, people are going to say, what, did this guy kill somebody and bury him? <laughs> I think Red Ryder wants to talk to you. <laughs> yeah, Red Ryder. You, were, you know that movie program, this little boy gets his Red Ryder. Yeah. <laughs> this wasn't a Red Ryder. It was one I bought out at Target. <laughs> and then that one wouldn't work, and I bought another one in Atlanta, and it won't, it's not that powerful. I, I'd knock squirrels out of the tree with those things. If you can kill deer, you can take care of tanks. <laughs>